Here's what the old prophet said. The truth will set you free. Now, here's the freedom of the truth. Number one, freedom of the truth to correct old errors in judgment. That's the freedom of the truth. Because if you don't speak the truth, then you're likely not to correct the errors in judgment. If something's wrong, but you say, hey, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. How are you going to correct the errors in judgment that made it wrong? See, you can't say it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, and finally it turns out to be fine. Say, no. The only way to go from wrong to fine is not by affirmation. The way to go from wrong to fine is to figure out where the errors in judgment were by speaking the truth. Something's wrong here. Finding out what's wrong, making the changes, now it can go from wrong to fine. Here's a good phrase. Affirmation without discipline is the beginning of delusion. Now, here's what else the truth does. First, it sets you free to correct old errors in judgment. Here's what else it does. Helps you to set up new, easy discipline to turn wrong into right, to turn lack into prosperity, to turn skepticism into faith. The final secret is discipline. But in order to turn wrong into right, we must speak the truth because only the truth will set you free. Free to correct an error in judgment. Because here's the formula for failure and here's the formula for success. Formula for failure, number one, a few errors in judgment repeated every day. We call that the formula for failure. Now, why would you repeat an error in judgment the second day? Reason, failure doesn't occur at the end of the first day. If it did, it would be helpful because then you wouldn't do that anymore. But errors in judgment are so subtle because they don't usually show their results and till for a while. But a few errors in judgment repeated every day, every day, every day, and sure enough, you're way off course. Business problems, family problems, personal problems, financial problems, emotional problems, we've all got these unique challenges. But when it comes to problems, I found a good way to go after a problem. It's the old, you know, draw a line down the center of the page and state the problem over here. Here it is. Sometimes you got to take some things out of your head and put it on paper. It's to state the problem, put it on paper. Said, I got this to deal with, I got this, I got this, I got this to deal with. Is that all of it? Say, well, no, there is a couple more things. Let's put it all out here. Because to come up here with the answers and solutions, we need to know really what the problem really is. You don't have to live in it. You don't have to dwell in it. You don't have to, you know, sit in it. But you do have to know it. Because you can't up, come up with good answers unless you know the whole problem. We don't gloss this over now. We, we go after this. What is the real problem? Now we come up with the answers. Now, there's three major questions to ask to solve most any problem. Number one, what could I do? No use going any further if you could solve it yourself. And it's good to get in the habit of seeing if you can come up with answers on your own. What could I do? And then just do a little what we call develop some working papers. I could do number one, number two, or number three. And then right away you say, I can see right now, and number three would take too long. Number two, I'm not sure. Number one, my first impression might be the best. What could I do? These working papers. Then if that doesn't do it, next is what could I read, right? Is there a book on this problem? Maybe someone else has wrestled with it and found a solution. Maybe I could check out the book. Here's author number one, two, number three. You say, well, number three is crazy. This guy's nuts. That's out. Well, maybe number one, number two. And you just, you just keep searching. Also, you might read your old journals. Maybe something you've recorded some time back has got an answer that you've skipped over and you go do a little research. And sure enough, it's in your own journals. What could I read? Now, if this doesn't work and this doesn't work, now you go to number three. Who could I ask? But don't go to number three now till you've really worked hard on number one and number two because you don't just need the answer to a, a problem. You need the answer muscle. You need the mental processes stirred. You need to learn the skill of solving problems to the best of your ability by yourself by yourself and for yourself. But if, if that doesn't work, now don't hesitate to ask. But don't ask first. See if you can solve it first. Then you've got some working papers to take to whoever you ask. And you come to somebody and say, look, I've done this, I've done this, I've researched this, and I still haven't got the answer. Could you help me? You can't believe how much quick, easy help you will get if it's evident right up front that you have tried your best to help yourself. We're all willing to invest some of our answers and time in somebody that we think it's worth it because they've really struggled to try to find the answer. Now, if we can come up with it, wouldn't that be great? So ask, but don't ask first. Now, here's the next part of, of the success formula. Learning to handle the passing of time. Patience to let the seasons work their work. You can't hurry the spring. 
It, it does its work in its time. You can't rush the summer. It does its work in its time. You can't shorten the winter. It's going to be however long or difficult it's going to be. You just must have patience with the unfolding of things from the beginning to reality, from nothing to something. Just make the note, there's always a way. Guess what's more valuable than money and capital? Ingenuity. The greatest capital in the world is ingenuity. Figuring out a way. I'll find a way. I'll start with nothing and find a way to turn nothing into profit. How can you turn nothing into profit? You sell and buy instead of buy and sell. If you have to, now sure it's better. If somebody says, yes, I want it, if you got it. You say, I don't have it. But if you will give me your money for this product, I will go get it, bring it to you, make a small profit. If I do it often enough, then I'll have some inventory. But you don't need inventory. Here's the greatest inventory, the inventory of the mind, the inventory of the personality, right? That's the greatest capital. Money serves its purpose. But what's money without courage? What's money without determination? Not much. It's worthless. But ingenuity and courage and determination and faith and charisma and personality. you got so much to invest besides your money. Make sure the money is the smallest part of your investment. Just a little money and a lot of courage. A little money and a whole lot of ingenuity and you can turn all kinds of nothing into something. Now, the patience of learning to handle the passing of time. Two things really wreck your chances for the future. Impatience and greed. You've got to learn to deal with both of those. To let things work out. Here's the other one that's a killer and that's greed. Contrary to the movie Wall Street, greed is not good. Greed is evil. Must be dealt with must be legislated against, lest some be tempted by greed. Here's what greed hopes for, something for nothing. Here's what greed hopes for, more than its share. Greed hopes for something at the expense of others. You say, well, then how can you truly grow and make a fortune? It's very easy. Legitimate ambition. Find a way to serve the many legitimately. And your ambition now can make you a fortune. You don't need greed to make a fortune. Here's what legitimate ambition wishes for, something at the service of others. Legitimate an ambition doesn't need to rise only because someone else diminishes. Legitimate ambition hopes to rise by helping others to rise. But learning to handle the passing of time, patience. How do you turn nothing into something? Here's how you start. There's three steps to it. Number one, imagination. And try to imagine yourself in those new, worthwhile, unique positions. So imagination starts to change everything. Now, imagination is not tangible, but it is almost real. Almost real. It's not real, but it's almost real. But it's hard to say that imagination is nothing. But it's nothing in terms of tangible. It's not, it's not tangible yet. But it is the beginning of turning nothing into something. It's the beginning of turning nothing into reality. Imagination. Imagination is the ability to see things that don't yet exist. Imagination is real in the sense that it affects It'll affect your behavior, it'll affect your enthusiasm, it'll affect your emotions. It's real in that sense, but it's not real in the tangible sense. But to turn nothing into something, you start with imagination. Next is faith. To believe that what you imagine is possible. How would we start to strengthen our belief in that what we imagine is possible to turn it into reality? And there's two or three ways. One is to believe your own testimony. If you've done it before, why couldn't you do it again? If you've done it once, couldn't you do it the second time? Why not believe in your own testimonial? If I did it before, I can do it again. I was rich by age 31 and broke by age 33. But now my question was, could I do it again? And the answer was, yes, of course. You know, I lost the money, but I didn't lose the skills. And that's what's important about personal development. You can lose the money, but not the skills. So who cares about the money? Unless it's getting late and you're like 90 and, you know, it's a little difficult to go back to the streets. But hey, once you've got the skills, you own the skills. It's like sales. A skill is more valuable than a sale. Someone, sometimes a salesperson says, I need a sale. I said, no, you need a skill. Sales are temporary. Skills are permanent. So we start with imagination, which is almost real. I mean, it's, it's not real yet. It's not tangible yet, but it's almost real. Now we move to faith to believe that what we imagine is possible. So we study our own testimony. If we've done it before, we can do it again. Here's what else we study. Other testimonials of somebody who did it. Somebody that built a hotel said, yes, I started with some plans and finally believed it was possible, and here it is. Say, well, if it's possible for one, it's possible for another. 
In fact, sometimes when we hear the testimonial, here's how they finish. If I can do it, you can do it. See, that that's a classic testimonial that gives us now what we call faith. And one of the ancient writers said, faith is generated by what we hear, the vocabulary of what we hear, the vocabulary of what we read. That generates faith to believe that it's possible. Now, faith is not reality. You can't say faith is nothing because it affects. It's like radiation. To us, it's nothing because it can't be seen. But radiation is so powerful, it can kill you, right? You can't see it, but it has an incredible effect. And that's true of faith. Faith can't be seen, right, with the natural eye. It can't be seen, but it has an incredible effect on your attitude, on your behavior, on your disciplines, on your work for the day, and all the rest. So faith is tangible in that sense, that it affects the emotions, it affects the drive. But we still don't have a hotel. Even though the imagination is very powerful and even though faith is very real, we still don't have a hotel because faith is not a hotel. Now, it's almost, it is so close. Here's what one writer described faith. Faith is a substance, a substance of hope. It's not a substance like a brick being a piece of the hotel, but it's almost, it's so close, it's substance. And it, the writer also said it's so close, it's evidence. Now, not evidence you can see, but tangible evidence that's just as real as all of our human experiences that can't be touched, can't be seen. It's called the unseen magic. Language is the unseen magic. It can't be seen. The words can't be seen as they're transmitted from the speaker to the one who listens, but it can have a profound effect. That means it's more than nothing. Language is more than nothing. But to create something out of nothing, we start with imagination, then we move to faith, which believes it's possible, which is almost real. Ideas gather dust, you know, they don't produce at all by themselves. It's like philosophy is not the end. Philosophy is the beginning. Philosophy must be invested. And if you invest philosophy and attitude in disciplines, then they produce results. Here's a good phrase. Wisdom uninvested in labor is wasted. Attitude, even the highest of attitude, which is faith. Faith uninvested is wasted, produces nothing. So the name of the game is not faith. The name of the game is not philosophy. The name of the game is to put faith and philosophy into activity so that it starts making progress. Isn't that true, though? Faith and imagination is almost, it's called evidence and substance. Now, it's still not tangible, but it's not far from tangible. But now here's what we do with faith and imagination. We deposit it in disciplines and activity because faith without the activity serves no useful purpose. Imagination without the activity to translate it into reality serves no purpose. But wisdom and faith deposited in activity creates reality, the reality of a career, the reality of a hotel that wasn't there. But you shouldn't start building the hotel until you have it finished. Is it possible to finish it before you start? And the answer is yes. It would be foolish to start unless you had it finished. Unique things to remember. Now, here's what now turns wisdom and faith into reality, and that's activity, muscle, the labor, the work. Some people go for affirmations, but see that I do believe in affirmations, but here's the key on affirmations, and that is to affirm the truth. If you're broke, best thing to affirm is I am broke. Something might be wrong with your philosophy, your policy, your plan, and your strategy. So, affirm, yes, but always affirm the truth. Now, here's all you got to do to turn that around. A few simple disciplines practiced every day starts to create success. Not at the end of the first day. The first day is the end of a new beginning. The first day. That you've started a new track. That you've started a new direction. So, we must all speak the truth. So affirm the truth. Yes, affirm God is good. Yes, affirm life is full of possibilities. Yes, affirm all the truthful possibilities. But you don't need to try to trick yourself into saying something is okay when it isn't okay. Some people say every day in every way I'm getting better and better. And if that's not true, see, that, then that we call that delusion. If it's not true, if it is true, then it's wonderful. It's fabulous. We should celebrate. But if it's not true every day in every way, I'm getting better and better. See, if that's not true, then it is an affirmation that's destructive. So just affirm the truth. The truth is I lack some skills. 
to multiply my income by 10, which I wish to do in the future. I need to learn the skills, affirm that you don't have the skills so that it'll drive you to get the skills because you want to multiply your income by 10. Yes, it is true. All things are possible to the believer. It is true. Errors in judgment lead to devastation. We don't just need the truth. We need the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Here's what we don't need. Delusion. You don't need delusion in order to try to make something out of nothing. All you need is this simple little formula to imagine because imagination is so powerful. It's the beginning of creating all things that we see. Then faith to believe it's possible. It says what? With faith, everything's possible. Without faith, nothing is possible. So that's a good study to make, creating faith to believe it's possible. But now we deposit faith and imagination into muscle, into discipline. Michelangelo was a genius, but it wasn't his genius that created this famous sculpture. But his genius was so strong and he believed in it so thoroughly that he picked up the chisel and the hammer. And it was the muscle and the chisel and the hammer that created the sculpture. And without the discipline, there would be no sculpture. But if you take your genius, if you take your ideas and your inspiration and your excitement and translate it into muscle, if you want good health, you can study every book there is and you can believe that it's possible to be healthy. But until you fall on the floor and start doing the push-ups, until you jog around the block, Right? And still you start working on your good health, working and laboring. Labor pains, we call it. And the mothers in the room would tell us what? It's a unique experience. But why would an upcoming potential mother be willing to put herself through rather painful experience uh, of giving birth? Here's why. It creates new life. So add this to your repertoire of good ideas. New life only comes from labor. Now, some people try to create it with affirmation, but it doesn't work. New life only comes from labor. That's why we should devote most of our time to labor because it's the miracle creator. It says six days labor and one day rest. Don't get those numbers mixed up. And here's why. It isn't rest that creates the miracle. It's labor that creates the miracle. And you just go right down the list. Labor creates the miracle of a career. Labor creates the miracle of a hotel. Labor creates the miracle of a fortune. You can have plenty of miracle. You don't need to engage in delusion. You just engage in reality. And here's what's real. Imagination, supported by faith, invested in labor, works miracle, right? The miracle of a relationship. The labor of my language produces the miracle of sight, being able to see things you couldn't see before. If I labor well enough with the vocabulary and language that I've got, describing the value of my own ideas translated for you, maybe it'll help you to see something today, tomorrow, that you've never seen before. So the labor of my language, the work, and lecturing is hard work. They say one hour of intense lecturing is like digging ditches for eight hours. The intensity and the energy and the vitality it takes. You just become almost exhausted sometimes in laboring with words to get your vocabulary out there where it touches someone's consciousness so that they can see something they've never seen before. And we call that miracle stuff. I don't know how it works. You don't need to know how it works. All you need is a simple analysis like this. But the labor takes the idea supported by faith, translate it into labor, and it starts producing all kinds of miracle. So now you can understand that you are a miracle worker. Would a miracle worker sleep late? I doubt it. Unique thing about genius, genius has no sense of time. It's amazing. If you could have met Michelangelo and, you know, you get there and it's like 11 o'clock, it's like midnight, and you said to Michelangelo, isn't it a little late? And Michelangelo would say, late, late, what is, what's, what's this late? What does that mean, late? I don't understand, late. To a genius, it's not late. To the average person, it's getting late. But to a genius, it's not late. Say, well, Michelangelo, I'll meet you here in the morning and watch you get started. And you got to get there at 4 o'clock. You see, it's really early. And Michelangelo says, early? What's er I don't understand this. What's this early? It doesn't compute early. Not to a genius. Because the genius is consumed by the finished product and he devotes his imagination and his faith translated into muscle to produce the sculpture. Now you can do that with your health. Health is just as valuable as the sculpture that inspires the world. You know, your own education, your own future, your own career, your own relationships, uh, building a hotel, creating success, making a fortune. It's all part of the same scheme of imagination, faith supported by labor. And now all things are possible to those that believe.